Good morning, church. How are you? Y'all struggling. I bet I know why you're struggling. How many of you stayed up to watch the Colorado, Colorado State game? How many of y'all were cheering for Colorado? Yeah, I'm concerned about the church. So let me tell you, um, first, for those who got baptized, man, what an incredible testimony. Um, and just to hear, it, it never gets old to hear how God continues to pursue people's hearts. Uh, those that don't know him, those that are running from him, those that were atheists. And just to hear what God does in people's lives is just amazing. And uh, as I was listening, they all did the same thing. They were living a certain way. Um, they were living a lie and they exchanged it for the truth. That's exactly what took place. They exchanged the lie for truth and it's just uh, an incredible thing to see. So proud of all of you um, who got baptized. Some of you may be wrestling with that. Uh, we encourage you to take that step of faith. Uh, it's just incredible to see how God impacts lives. Last night, um, I typically, I get up at four in the morning on Sundays, and so I try to go to bed early Saturdays, uh, except um, Dion was on TV. And so I stayed up and it was getting later and later. And my wife came in and told my son and I, who's 12, uh, we're sitting there watching and she said, hey, it's, it's time for y'all to go to bed. <laughs> um, for those of you who are not yet married, uh, let me tell you, there will be a time where your wife comes and you're like, it's time to go to bed, all right? <laughs> Um, well, that was one of those times last night, and she was looking out for me. She knew I had to preach this morning. She's like, honey, it's getting pretty late. It's time to go to bed. And I just said, honey, it's, it's Dion. I'm not going to bed. And, um, and then she's like, okay. And then my son, uh, which is amazing how a 12-year-old boy can, can has, has more maturity sometimes. He's like, dad, uh, it's getting pretty late, and you got to preach. He said, I really don't think this game's worth it, dad, to stay up this late. <laughs> I said, boy, don't you ever talk like that about Dion Sanders. <laughs> Dion is always worth it, son. <laughs> so nonetheless, I stayed up late uh, to watch it um, just over, uh, about, just about midnight, because you got to watch the post game too. And, uh, and, and here's the thing, uh, here's why I did this. When I, when I was growing up, um, I don't know if it was a search of identity or something, but I idolized Dion. I mean, I, I, I played the positions he played. I wasn't as good, but I played them. I wore the same football number Dion wore. I, when I scored a touchdown, very seldomly, I would dance like Dion danced in the end zone. Um, I would have the drip like Dion. I, I looked really, really cool. And I thought, and I, here's what I, I, I idolized the guy. I really did. Everything he did, I thought was just cool. I tried to dress like him. Um, I went to the dollar store and bought some sunglasses, the big ones. I bought a fake gold chain, you know, the one that turns green when you jump in the water. Um, I did all of that. And then I, I matured. I matured and I was like in middle school, maybe high school and thought I'm, I'm too grown to be trying to look like another grown man. And so then there was a season where I was just like, I'm, I'm gonna be me. And in that pursuit to be me, trying to figure out who I was at this point, I love what Alex said, he built the foundation on himself. That was kind of me. I built the foundation on myself. Then all of a sudden I started listening to R&B music. Um, this is before I was saved. Um, and then I thought, man, this guy looks cool. This is who I want to be like. His name was Cisco. And so <laughs> I dyed my hair platinum. It's hard for you to imagine because I don't have hair, but when I had hair, I dyed it platinum. So I went to Walmart, I bought a $10 kit. Um, I dyed my hair because I wanted to look like Cisco. Uh, the problem was I fell asleep and when I woke up, I accidentally dyed my eyebrows blonde. <laughs> then, then when I got, by my senior year, I like, this was crazy, it's just I didn't know who I was. There was this search for significance in my identity. Um, and so then all of a sudden, Allen Iverson came on the scene <laughs> and I was playing basketball at this point. And so I wanted to be like Allen Iverson. And so I wore Jinkos, I, wore, I did all this to look like him. And here, here was the, the crazy thing. As I look back now, um, I look back and I wish I can sit down and just talk to that young man who would change identities every six months or every year. And as I look back, I ask myself, and I look at the pictures and I laugh and I chuckle, the things that I wore, the things that I try to be. 
And if I could go back and talk to me as a young man, I would probably ask myself the question, what are you searching for? Be because really I was molded by my environment all the time. And as I look back, I recognize since I was a little boy, there was a gap of an identity. And as I began to be get older, I, I searched for that identity. And I was very vulnerable because that search for an identity led me to be crazy. I was insecure. I was, I was hungry for affirmation. I wanted to know people liked me. I, want, I needed words of affirmation, so I did things to be affirmed. As I look back, I recognize the, the, the idols in my heart changed shapes and size. The idols in my heart would change every six months because I kept pursuing things that I thought would give me value and identity. And I let the world tell me what that was supposed to be. And I was living this entire lie. And I was on the outside, you know, I looked like I knew what I was doing. I looked like I understood culture and I was cool and I was relevant. On the inside, I was empty. Because although I was seeking these idols, these idols didn't even know who I was. I never met Dion. Never met Alan Iverson. These idols paid me no attention why I really invested my entire life to look and be like them. And it's amazing because as an adult now, I recognize, if I'm being really honest with you all, that there are still idols in my heart that want to be revived from when I was five. There was an image created in my heart that is hungry to be revived and hungry to be worshiped. And here's the thing, in this room today, here, here's the truth. I don't know if you recognize this, but here's the truth. In this room today, we will, you will wrestle with idols in your life. Every single day, there will be something in your heart that competes for Jesus' position in your life. You will have things in your life that, that are going to compete for your devotion. There will be things in your life that will compete for your energy, for your passion, for your strength. And some of these things aren't even bad. But here's what can happen if you're not careful. That what can happen to us when these idols begin to be formed, these idols, here's the thing about these idols. These idols tell us that, that they will fulfill us. They tell us that they will bring security. They tell us that they will bring comfort. They tell us a lot of stuff. And we begin to believe these idols that are formed, that are, are made in these images. And sometimes the, the idols change, but the craving doesn't. So, so maybe in here something happened to you when you were a child and then that something was created, that, that, that idol was planted in your heart and now the enemy forever recognizes that the thing you crave is attention. The thing that you crave is affirmation. The thing that you crave is success. The thing that you crave is money. The thing that you crave are relationships. Uh, the thing that you crave is, I don't know what it is, but the enemy recognizes what we crave. And what, what he will begin to do, because we all have cravings in this room, what we will begin, he will begin to do is he will play into these cravings. But here is a crazy thing, is that these cravings are not bad. Therefore, they are hard to discern when they have taken Jesus' rightful position. So what can happen in your life is here is the thing. You can be in this room today. You could have just lifted your hands to Jesus and he still not be first in your life. Like just, you could be sitting in this room. You could be wanting to hear the word of God. But the truth is, if you were to look at your heart and look at the devotion of your life, because the devotions of our lives expose what we and who we are worshiping. So we could be in this room. We can say, we know Jesus is all we need. We know he's number one, but our lives don't reflect what we say we believe. And the danger about that is it can happen to anybody in this room, including myself. Do you know every single week I have to be aware of the idol that wants to be revived in my heart? Do you know that somewhere in here there's a five-year-old little boy who's still looking for affirmation? I have to be aware that, that the enemy will, will take me to the place of insecurity where I'm seeking affirmation. And I think that my affirmation as a pastor comes from whether or not you like me. 
And, and, and what happens is that people become an idol in my life because I look to people sometimes. The little boy in me looks to people to affirm me. And then my whole mood changes based off what somebody says about me. You say something good, I'm feeling like I'm living God's will. You say something bad, I don't even know if I'm saved all of a sudden. The reason why is because I have made people's opinion a God and an idol in my life. I can come up here and preach, I can come up here and lift my hands, but the truth is that idol is hungry to be revived. Now, you're asking why am I talking about these idols? Here's what I want to say because I don't want you to dismiss this word. In the Bible, idols were images that they would create and they would worship and they would serve because they needed something tangible. Uh, I'm going to give you this definition of an idol so we're all on the same page, okay? Listen to this. John Piper says this. He says, here's an idol. Anything that we come to rely on for some blessing. Now watch this, this is gonna bring, it's gonna bring it home a little bit closer. Anything we come to rely on for some blessing. So a blessing, this word blessing in the Greek, it means happy, it's, it's a state of heart, state of mind. So I would ask you in plain layman terms, um, what do you rely on to make you happy? This is a good question. For a blessing or help or guidance in the place of wholehearted reliance in the true live and the true and living God. So anything that you seek, that you look for affirmation, something you make uh, that you want to make you happy. If we come to crave, love, depend on, and trust for a blessing, people's praise to enhance our self-exaltation, or money, or power, or sex, or family, or productivity, or anything else besides God himself for the greatest blessing help, guidance, and satisfaction, then in essence, we are doing what idolatry has always done. So if you take that, I'm going to leave it up here. If you take this definition of an idol, I would ask you this morning, what in your life is competing for God's rightful position in your life? What is it? Who is it? Who in your life do you really need the affirmation from? Who in your life do you really need this from? Who in your life have you set expectations, expectations on that they can't meet? Here's a good way to answer it. Who are you most angry with right now? Here's what happens. You, you, you go into work and you have expectations of your employer. They don't meet them. You start getting angry. You start getting bitter because you place expectations on them that God never intended you to place. You, you go to school and you have roommates and you have friends and they, you feel like they have betrayed you or turned on you because you place expectations on them to serve you in the way they never served you or were intended to serve you. So you here you're upset. You dated somebody and you changed your entire life for this person. You changed everything. You dropped your friends. You changed careers. You changed states. You made this person an idol. You put all of your attention. You put all of your efforts. You put all of your, you put everything in this individual, expecting them to do for you what only God can do. One day they told you they didn't want to be with you anymore. Your idol was shattered. And there you are bitter and angry at God. Like we, we, all can, we all can do this, right? We all can make these things to say, I know you're real, but I need this right now. And there's a temptation in all of us in this room today to do this, to, to take Jesus off the throne and you begin to put something above Jesus. It's not that you don't believe in Jesus. It's just that your devotion is really towards something else. So to make it in layman terms, the easiest way I can put this, if you want to write this down, if you're wondering what in my life is competing for God's attention, here's what I would tell you to check yourself in. When your devotion to something has become greater than your devotion to God, it has become an idol. When your devotion to something or to someone has become a, a devotion greater to them than to God has become an idol. And I know what you're asking now in your mind. So what happens if this is my life? How am I supposed to do this? So in the book of Hebrews, you have these people that knew God existed, they knew Jesus existed, but let me just bring you into their world for just a minute. They had created idols, and here is why. Because they were going through tough times during this time of their lives. They were going through persecution. They were desperate. They were hungry for God to move. They wanted something divine to hold on to. 
They were at a point in their lives where they seemed like God was not showing up. Like they were faithful, they were serving, but they didn't see the work of God. Like you have come to the point in your life at some point where life has gotten hard and you've asked the question, where are you, God? You ever been there before? You asked the question, where are you, God? This is a question they were asking, where are you, God, in the middle of this persecution? Where are you, God? We need something tangible. So they, they end up creating idols, except their idols weren't earthly idols. They were heavenly idols. They created idols out of angels. So they knew there was this hierarchy. The Bible speaks of angels hundreds of times. It gives us their different roles. It tells us there's a hierarchy of angels. So these people started serving angels. Let me tell you why. They, there are all kinds of angels. There are cherubs that were little sweet little baby angels to where I guess if they were lonely and wanted to snuggle a baby, they would pray to the baby angel, I guess. Then you would have cherubim. Cherubims, these are known in Scripture as guardian angels. You see them in Genesis uh, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, you see them protecting and guarding God's stuff or God's creation. Um, this is the way they are depicted because this is where they are described. This doesn't look too uh, exciting. It looks a bit scary. Um, a lion, an ox, a human face, and an eagle up there. But this is the way they're depicted in Scripture. Another angel, the seraphim, the seraphim angel, uh, this is the one we see in Isaiah 6. These are the type of angels that are depicted in the Bible. The seraphim angel is known as the angel that worships. It worships God, but, but God is so holy that the seraphim angel had to hide its face and its feet and cover its entire fleshly body, whatever it says it has in the scripture, because God is so holy. It says that it has six different wings. Um, that doesn't look too cuddly, all right? Nonetheless, it's in Scripture. Then you hear of this angel, Michael the archangel, the angel that was above the other angels. This is the angel you call on for protection. This is the angel that defeats and fights against Satan. This is the angel that defeats all kinds of, of people. This is the angel that God uses as a warrior going to battle angel. So in Scripture, there are all kinds of angels the Bible talks about. Angels are unseen principalities. Angels can, can take human form. Uh, angels can, uh, or demons can, can possess people. These are spirits, unseen spirits. Um, the unseen spirits work for God. Some of the unseen spirits work for Satan. And there's different things that they do, different roles. So these people would cling on to these angels. They would say, I know Jesus is real, but, but these angels will actually come through for me. So they made idols out of these angels. This is what's scary about this, is that people took things that God created and worship the created versus the creator. Because these things weren't bad, right? Angels weren't bad. They're not bad things unless they take the seat of Jesus. And that's what happened. Look at verse 5 in your Bibles. And I'm going to share three points today. Uh, number one, when speaking about idols, idols were placed above Jesus and that within became the problem that they, here, here's, let me, verse 5, listen to this. For to which of the angels did God ever say? This is a rhetorical question that comes from Psalm 2. You are my son. You know what this means? It means that he is, he is putting up their idols. This is an idol. Put yours right here. Insert your idol. I want you to do that. Whatever you think, this can be an idol. It can be a sport. Sports aren't bad. They're bad if they come above Jesus. It could be um, money. Money's not bad. It's bad. It becomes higher than Jesus. So here's they said, angels, not bad, came above Jesus. For to which of the idols, angels, did God ever say, you are my son? The author is helping to sober people up saying, look, your idol doesn't have what Jesus has. So he says this, Jesus has authority. Now, let me ask you this. Whatever idol you put in here, church, does your idol, do your idols have the same power as Jesus? The answer is no. Your idol, that person, that thing, cannot do what Jesus can do. So the author is restating. He wants them to do this. Here's your idol. Here's Jesus. And he's trying to get them to do this. Not throw away the angel. So if you're in here today um, and, and you, you are... Uh, or a career person or a student, you're like, do I throw this away? No, you just put Jesus back in his proper position. So what he's saying is, you are my son. 
authority. Today I have begotten you. It means that he sets him apart. He is the, in essence, the nature of God. Jesus is the nature and character of God. And he says, or again, I will be to him a father. So watch this. Now he speaks of the intimacy that Jesus has with the father. So our next question is, does your idol have the authority that Jesus has? And does your idol have the intimacy that Jesus has? Absolutely not. But watch, watch what we do, because here's what happens. There's a great danger in this because it's a slow fade, church. Whatever you are most devoted to, it's a slow fade because we will find ways to justify um, uh, putting things above God, sometimes not even knowing. And there's a great danger. And he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So watch this. Look at this right here. There's an exchange going on here. The people worshiped angels. God is saying, I created angels to worship him. In other words, there is a danger to worship what God has created. There is a danger to worship and serve what has been created versus having what has been created serve you. So this thing you are most devoted to, are you serving it or is it serving you? Think about that for a moment. The thing that you are most devoted to or the person you are most devoted to or the sport you are most devoted to, how much power does this thing have in your life? Does it control your mood? Does it control your life? Does it control your attitude? How does it control your identity? Does it? And I, listen, I get it. I have been there and over and above because the truth is I will leave here on Sunday mornings and my identity will be wrapped up on how I presented to you. So I get the struggle. I do it every week. I get it every single week. So I get the struggle, but, but how much does this thing identify who you are? Now, the, the crazy thing is, um, that, that this is a slow fade and, and what he is doing is say, let all God's angels worship him. So here's what he's saying. Uh, right now, you have it like this. This is how they had it. He says, what we need to do is switch these two things. Because this right here, whatever that is, although it may be good because it was created by God, it cannot do what Jesus can do. You need to exchange the proper seat. And here's what he says. Let me tell you why. There is uh, the thing about our God He's not a forceful God. He, he speaks to us in, in like warnings and he's, he's gentle. And I don't know where you stand on predestination and Calvinism and Arminianism. And people often want to know, Pastor, what do you believe in predestination? What do you believe about free will? And here's what I would tell you. When the Bible speaks about God predestining something, I preach on what it says. When the Bible speaks about free will, I preach free will. People often want to know how much control does God have in our lives and our decision making. Um, let me just show you the heart of God here. In Romans chapter 1, God begins to speak about these people that have created idols. And here's what he says in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. During this time, people were saying God is not real because they can't hear him or see him or he's not speaking to them. So they are rejecting God because they're like, God's not real. What he is saying is that you are suppressing the truth and there is a consequence to that. Verse 19 says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. That's pretty harsh, Jesus. And exchange the glory of the immortal God for images. Here's what's happening. When you begin to give your full devotion to something other than God, you exchange the truth about God for a lie. Verse 25, because they exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the, create, the, the creature rather than the creator 
who is blessed forever, amen. Here's what's happening. Um, people had excuses that God uh, was hiding and God was not being seen. But here's what I would tell you. Because of the scripture in this room today, God cannot be accused of hiding, but man can, can be accused of not seeking. God cannot be accused of hiding today in this room. So if you're here wondering and you're seeking, I applaud you for seeking. Be like, how do I know he's real? I want to challenge you tonight, right about 7.30 or 8, it's going to get dark. This moon's going to come out, then there are going to be stars. I want you to go out there and I want you to look at the moon and the stars. And he's saying, hey, this is me. I am creator. I did all this. I put all this in place. This is me. I am powerful. So God can never be ex accused of being a God who is hiding because he speaks every day, all day. But man can be accused of not seeking him. And these people, although they saw him, they said, we wanted this craving, this image so badly that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And what God says about this is, I'm going to let you feel the wrath of this idol. Let me tell you what your idol will do to you, church, this morning. Your idol is temporary. Whatever that idol is today in your life, at some point it will end. You have to know that I'm not saying throw it away, but I want you to be aware that that thing that you are putting all of your security and comfort in, at some point it will come to an end. Your idol is temporary. But in order to deal with this idol, you have to acknowledge what those idols of your heart are. You have to. Is it affirmation? Is it you? Is it success? Is it money? Is it friends? Did you grow up in a way to where, I mean, I've always been lonely, so now I need a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know what it is, but you have to acknowledge what that idol might be, and you have to realize that they, it's temporary, whatever it is. Verses 7 through 10 uh, begins to say that God, he makes his angel winds and his ministers a flame of fire, meaning these, these winds and fire are temporary things that the angels have. So he's telling them, stop worshiping the things because these are temporary. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. wickedness. Therefore, God... Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Now he's putting God back in his proper place, saying, here is God and here is your idol. You've got to do this because your idol cannot do what God can do. It is absolutely temporary. Here's the thing about our idols, church. Idols play into our fantasies but will never help us with our realities. Your idol will play into your fantasy all day long. You will, you, will, you will dream about it. You will fantasize about the way this is going to go. You will put your energy there. You will put your money there. You will put your time there. You will put your efforts there. But what happens when your idol doesn't serve you the way you have been serving it? What's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to you when you have been devoting your entire life to this thing and maybe, just maybe, it's not going to work out just the way you thought? What's going to happen to you? When you become angry and bitter because this thing you have been serving and giving your, th your life to hasn't been serving you? What's going to happen? Now, let me just tell you this straight up. Let me, let me just tell you whether it's a person, a thing, whatever um, I'm just going to be openly honest. This thing that you love and desire, there's this great passion that you have, and so it's created this narrative that you are writing. You don't even know it's the, if it's the one God's writing. It's the one you are writing. And it's like it's this, it's this fantasy of how it's supposed to go. And what happens is this, watch this, is that when this, when this idol becomes big enough, you build a kingdom around the idol. And when anybody or anything threatens this kingdom, you, you begin to not like this person or these people or these things. Whatever threatens your kingdom, you begin to hate this person. You begin to hate this thing because they are threatening your kingdom and messing with your idol. 
and, and it's a challenge. It is a challenge over and over and over and over. And as, as I say this, that we create these fantasies, it is true that just because you created the fantasy doesn't mean it's gonna turn into a reality. And that's the hard pill to swallow, is to say, God, these are my passions, these are my desires, but it's whatever you want. Uh, there are two men in our church who, who I think the world of, they become great brothers to me um, in, in the Lord. They, they both played professional baseball, and um, it's Troy Silva and Jose Rio Berger. Uh, they, they are men of God, and here's why I'm sharing this with you, because these two men of God, baseball, professional sport, was their thing at one point. It was an idol to them, I'm sure they would tell you. And at some point, they recognized, so if you're wondering, if I want to do this, how do I do it? Let me share this with you, because they, I think they do it perfectly, in my opinion. The, the baseball became the thing. They get drafted, they go play, they get saved, and here's what ends up happening, this thing. And God is so kind that he didn't take it away. And, and, and there was this idol, right? In this pursuit of idol, they came, they came and they met Jesus. And here's what happened. It's like this was everything. This was my worth. This was my life. And this was a lie. And so Jesus is now everything. He is my worth. He is my comfort. He is my identity. He is my security. But what I love is that they didn't stop baseball. And now they run a, a, an academy that's unapologetically Christian. Through their academy and through their giftings, they are unapologetically sharing about Jesus. So sometimes it's not throwing away the gifting or passion. Sometimes it's reorganizing your devotion. Sometimes it ain't about like, look, I don't know how to, I don't know how to balance this out. I don't know how to, let me just tell you, it doesn't work like this. This passion, this thing will never serve you. Let me tell you where it's best seated, underneath the authority of the one who gave it to you. Don't worship this, worship this and say, look, like God, I recognize you gave this to me. Help me to put it in its proper perspective. Help me to put it, help me to use this thing you have given me to glorify you. Is the thing that you most desire more powerful in your hands or in God's? Then stop holding it so tightly because you are limited. So take it, listen, what is it? What is it? You know what I have to do? I'm just gonna, I, you know what I have to do? I have to be 100% honest with you. Every, every single Sunday, I have to leave here. I get in my car and I wonder if the people who got up, were they going to the restroom? Did I say something that offended them? It's just perfect. It's, it really is perfect timing. It's perfect timing. You know, I love you. I love you. That's my guy right there. He's my guy. I love him. But you know, legit, I want you to think about this. It is mental torture. Every Sunday I have to wonder, did I offend another person? Did I do, 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 do? And then I get to the point eventually, because you know how you get so tired of caring what people think, you get to the point where you say, man, I don't care what anybody thinks. But you really do care what they think. <laughs> but it pushes me to say, you know what, God? My value and identity can't be whether or not somebody liked my sermon. My value and my identity has to be who you has created me to be. So let me tell you today, your value and your identity cannot be what other people think about you. Amen. Your value and your identity has to come from the one that has created you. Amen. So maybe stop worshiping the opinion of man and woman and leave God back where he needs to be. Because when, when, when you are driven by what people think about you, here, here's, you, gotta, you gotta check your heart, you're right here. It's about you. And you have become your own God, how you look, how you're viewed, and how many followers you have on social media. Can I talk real for a moment? But God is saying, look, if I, God is saying, if you worship me, I know why I've created you. If you worship me, I will not fail you. Your idol, your thing that you are, it will eventually fail you. Have a best friend? they will fail you. Have a church, they will fail you. I didn't say I, they will fail you. <laughs> have parents, have children, have money, have a spouse. I don't know what that's like, mine never has, but yours <laughs> will fail you. Hey, you know this. 
Man, God has created this great stuff for us. But he created it to be part of enjoyment. He created it to serve us, not so that we serve it. So look, church, I don't know what's in your heart this morning. And I'm gonna ask the band to come up and I just want you to do work and I can't get this out of my head. In Romans 1, I can't get this out of my head that they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And I just wonder in this room today, how many of you have exchanged the truth about who God can be and who God is in your life for the lie of this thing, that this thing will bring you value, that it'll bring you success, that it will bring you identity? It will not. It will embarrass you. It will leave a trail of destruction and pain. It will leave a trail of bitterness. Now uh, I have recognized those things that I I'm struggling with as my idol. I am recognized that um, it's going to fail me no matter what it is. I have recognized where I'm having to put my identity in my hope. And what I would tell you today, if you are living a lie that is telling you that this other thing or this other person in your life is supposed to do what Jesus can do, uh, let me just tell you, this morning, would you make the decision to exchange that? Exchange that lie you've been living for the truth. What is the truth? that that thing will eventually fail you, but Jesus never will. That thing you are devoted to, you are hoping it brings you identity, hoping Jesus already has. So this morning, if that thing is right here, man, don't throw it away, because some of you are gifted beyond measure. Don't Don't throw it away. Just put it back in the hands of God. Amen. Don't throw it away. No, don't. Don't be ashamed about it. Don't even be ashamed about this. If you're like, oh my gosh, that's me. No, 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 no. You know what this is? This, this is God going to his child, saying, I love you enough to tell you, do this. So whatever is in your life and in your heart, and listen, here, here might be the truth too. You may need to throw some things away. Right, Can I just be honest with you? Like there, there may, you, some of you may be in a dating relationship you know you should not be in and your identity is wrapped up in it. Stop it. Man, don't do it. Don't do it. It's going to leave a trail of hurt, pain, and bitterness and destruction. Look, what would life be like? Man. You know, my son plays sports. And sports is a big deal in our house. I'm telling you right now, sports is like Jesus and right here. <laughs> and if Prime's on, I'm like, ooh, God, you know what I'm saying? You, it's like this. If Dion's on the TV, it's like this. Like, they're fighting for our attention. Right. So you know what I do with my son to put God back in his proper perspective? Here's what I do. It's about between every football game, before every baseball game, basketball game, I bring him in or before they do anything. I do this to all my kids. All right, God, this is my exact prayer every time. They're sick of it. (laughs) But I want you to watch, watch, follow me. Don't leave. No one leave just yet. Please follow me. Watch this. Because I know that sports can become an idol to me because I got my value from there. So sometimes I wrestle with not getting my value from my kids through sports because I think it makes me look better. Little boy inside. So there's a lot of men who still act like the five-year-old boy inside. That was me. That's me, by the way. And in order to put sports underneath Jesus, this sounds so crazy, but I can't be the only one in this room, right, that has something. I bring my son in. He's like, God, uh, just help him to know that no matter how he plays today, his value doesn't come from his performance. God, help him to know that no matter how he plays today, it doesn't change what you have planned for him, for his life. And God, would you protect him? And God, would you help him to glorify you in this sport? Some way, God, would you just help him to glorify you, whether his character, whether, you know what my son did? He used a Christian rap song for his walk-up music called King Jesus. So I say that all the time. You know, you want to hear something cool? 
so I pray this, right? Because it does this. Like we're so concerned about the, the sport. You got to do this. God, you got to kill it. You got to kill it. You got to kill it. When we start praying, it's like this. Amen. That's what happens. It's really cool. You should try it. It's like, <laughs> God, help me with my roommate in school or my professor. I don't know how they got this job. They, I don't know how they got here, Lord. <laughs> it's a... <laughs> Lord, help me with this roommate because they're claiming Jesus or they're living like Satan. God, you got to help me with this. If you don't help me with my spouse, Lord, you gave him to me. This is becoming a thorn in my side, Lord. Right, but what happens is you become to pray about this issue. You put it back in its proper hands and perspective. My daughter went to L.A. for some acting stuff she's doing. She's 10. And I wasn't there because I was here preaching to you. <laughs> but my son went, who's 12. And she goes and she's about to do this little acting thing. She's 10. And my son says, Mamie, come here. He's 12. He said, let me pray for you. You know what he prayed? God help Mamie to know that her performance is not, doesn't give her her worth in you, God. God, we don't want this if it's not from you. He's 12. He's 12. You know what happened in that moment? Her little acting thing became secondary to who's in control. So look, I don't know what's in control of your life right now, but it needs to become secondary if it's not Jesus. So how do you do it? God, help me to put you first. God, before this game, would you help me to honor you with all that I have? God, before I, when I get these funds and I get this raise, God, I'm so grateful that you gave me the raise at work. Help me to honor you with this race. God, that you gave me this, and I'm so glad. Help me to honor this, God. God, you gave me so many social media followers. It's awesome. How, how do I honor you with these social media followers? God, you gave me these kids. I'm not going to be perfect, but how do I honor you? How do you put God in his proper perspective so you won't be disappointed when that idol fails you? You just acknowledge him. God, I've been so lonely. I thank you for sending this person. And although we are dating, God, I'm going to leave it in your hands because, God, I don't want this person. If this person is not from you, if you're married, it's too late. But if this person, God, <laughs> you should have prayed that while, a long time ago. <laughs> but do you get it? Do you get it? What do you need to do this morning to put God back in his proper seat? Father, we pray this morning, and I first want to pray for the Christians. Look, you know this already. You know this, and I don't know what in your heart, but it's something. We all have something, by the way. Don't, do not be fooled and thinking, that, that ain't me. I'm good. Maybe your pride is it. I don't know. I have no clue. For the Christians, just let God work. Let him show you what is in your heart. And then there's some of you in this room who are you, I love Alex's testimony when he was getting baptized. He said, my, my foundation became about me. Everything was about me. And, and look, it wasn't working out. He believed a lie that make it about you and that's how it's supposed to be, but it left him empty. He believed a lie and he exchanged that lie for the truth. This morning in this room, I want to ask you the question. If you're here this morning, you're saying, look, this whole thing has been about me. It's not working out. I don't know Jesus. I've been living this lie of success and I've been living this lie of all kinds of stuff. And I want to exchange the lie for the truth. So let me tell you what the truth is. Here's the truth if you're listening today. The truth is that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means you have and I have missed God's standard for our lives. The truth is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is the truth. And the truth is that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the truth. And that will never fail you. So this morning, here's my challenge. For those of you that have never given your life to Jesus, this morning, here is your option. Do you want to exchange the lie for truth? And his name is Jesus. 
His name is Jesus. Listen, in this room, all eyes closed and all heads bowed. If that is you saying, this morning, I surrender all. Last hour, we had so many people give their lives to Jesus. This morning, if you're saying, I surrender all, I want to exchange the lie for the truth of Jesus. I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I need the Son. If that is you, all eyes closed. We you just raise your hand all across the room? If that is you saying, I surrender, amen, amen. There are a lot of you, amen, amen. There are a lot of you, amen, amen. Keep raising them, keep raising them, keep raising them, keep raising them, amen, 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 amen. Listen, I'm not even going to waste time. If you are honest, here's what I want you to do. Raising your hand doesn't save you. Walking in an aisle doesn't save you. Standing won't save you. Placing your faith in Jesus Christ will save you. And if you want to do that this morning, here's what I want you to do. On the count of three, there are so many of you. And I'm not asking you to do this because I think that it's some kind of, you know, just thing to do in church. I want you to do it so you remember the moment you stood for Jesus. The moment you traded the lie for the truth. So if that is you with your hand raised on the count of three, I just want you to stand and everybody is going to erupt like the Cardinals just won a football game. I know it's hard to imagine, but I need you to do it. One, two, three. Amen. They're already standing. Keep standing. Amen. Amen. Keep standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. Come on. Anybody else? Keep standing. In the balcony. There's a lot in the balcony. Come on. Come on. Keep standing. Stand standing. Hey, here's what I want you all to do. Here's what I want you all to do. Here's what I want you all to do. Look, I want everyone to stand with them. And if you stood, our pastors would be up front. I just want you to walk the aisle. You need this for you and God to remember the moment you exchange a lie for a truth. And that is you who stood. I just want you to walk the aisle. As they come down, we are going to sing. We are going to celebrate. And we want to give you a Bible. Praise God, you're already coming. You are ready. Praise God right here. Hey, if that is you, just keep coming on the balcony. Y'all come down on the balcony. We want to pray with you and give you a Bible. Let's sing this together.